Talk of the Trollway spotlights Mount Hora, Wisconsin's unique artists, entertainers, hobbyists, and personalities. Funding for Talk of the Trollway is provided by Miller & Sons Supermarket. Bryn Bruin has cooked bat in Indonesia. She's been arrested in Russia. She's been assigned as the photographer for the Dalai Lama. These days, she lives with her husband in Mount Horeb to be close to family. Their small rented house is decorated with memories of her travels, a bullet casing from Beirut, an oversized print of one of her most important photos, and an enviable library of cookbooks. This is a great dish. I'm your host, Gary Schutz, and on this episode of Talk of the Trollway, Bryn explains how her interest in photography provided the opportunity to travel the world. Those travels introduced her to innumerable styles of cooking, which led to more travel and even more photography. She often shares her experiences and her talents with a few close neighbors and friends. Because what we're going to do is we're going to fold this thing in half. Today, it's our turn. My family tells me that when I have a camera in my hand, I'm not the same person. I'm extremely intense. When I'm, whenever I'm working with photography, it's, it's just something that I'm in my own world. And I'm always thinking about several different things. For example, when I'm photographing someone, there's, what I, there's what's happening in the moment. There's the way in which I'm composing it. And then there's what they're saying, what, what I'm, I'm perceiving that they say. So all of these things are going on while I'm trying to get the shot. Just by going on one assignment, you could see many different kinds of things in which you could also take an interest in. And it, it just wasn't very hard. Food was just the next step because if, well, if I can do people, I can do food because I like food. And that, that then brought me to, uh, to the Gourmet magazine and to uh, uh, Food and Wine. And then they would send you off and, and, and you'd do food. Well, you're, you're doing food and then you get a little wine thrown in there. And, and then you, you, you know, so you get to go to cooking schools of different kinds. I went to Moroccan cooking school from the King. Um, I've gone to the Oriental Bangkok. I spent two months in Indonesia doing, Indo, studying Indonesian food, and not from famous chefs, but from the, from the women in the country. We went to eight different islands to learn the eight different styles, including cooking bat. <laughs> and in certain parts of Indonesia, they eat everything out of the garden. I mean, it's a, a dog and all kinds of things. Uh, so it's, it, it, it was just, it, it just, it was just there, so why not take advantage of it? I think what it is is I become um, very intense. I, I'm, I'm very, very focused. I can't take a camera with me if I don't intend to use it. I can't, and, and it's kind of sad because I, I don't have that enjoyment of, you know, casual walk in the woods. If I have a camera in my hand, I'm going to use it for something and I'm looking for something. And uh, to complete an assignment or, or, or whatever. But it's an intensity that, um, I don't know where it comes from, but it's there. I know it's there. I don't, I don't hear anything. I just, I'm just focused. Has it ever got you in trouble? Ooh. <laughs> yeah. That, that you're willing to share with us? <laughs> yeah. Um, I was arrested in Russia <laughs> on May Day. I was very bored with the, seeing the... I, I've been to Russia many times, and so I decided that the only way I could get rid of my guide was to get him drunk. So that's not hard when you're in Russia. And so I got him drunk and slipped out the back way and I went into this small town and I wanted to photograph, you know, sort of the, the, the life of the average Russian and it, it, it's pretty tough actually. And I'm walking through the town and somebody started screaming, you know, well, you know, something in Russia, but it was pretty obvious that she didn't want me to be there. And then, you know, a few minutes later, some guys in some leather coats came up in a little black car. And, 
I was smart enough not to take my passport. You don't take your passport because then they can't take it away from you. But uh, it, it took a while to convince them that it was okay. But I didn't do it again. <laughs> You don't really need to speak every language of, of the countries you go to. You know, it's amazing what a smile will do, or a laugh, or, or something like that, uh, or interest in what, what's going on has carried me much, much further than the ability to speak the language. When we lived in, in the Netherlands, I worked for a foundation called Tiger Trust, and that was the first foundation which um, sponsored uh, His Holiness the Dalai Lama's trips to Europe because they realized that, you know, in Tibet, Tibetans were being murdered by the Chinese, so we have to get His Holiness known in the Western world, and I was his photographer. And I took this picture here, and we were both 30-ish at the time, and it is a photograph of a woman who escaped from Tibet and was given this gift to travel to the Netherlands to meet His Holiness uh, for the first time in her life. So she had, uh, had all this, this trauma in her life and it was, of course, uh, a climax to be able to come and to meet him. And I was allowed the, the advantages to get close enough to him because he wasn't as famous as he is now. And and show the true compassion of, of his actions towards her and uh, her reaction to him. The two of them were speaking Tibetan, but it was quite clear uh, from her reaction uh, to him how she felt about meeting him. I've always okay. had this, um, more or less on the spiritual side of things, I've had this, this desire to do something uh, with my photography where I could show people a different point of view. I wanted to, to, to show, make people aware of things and to the best of my knowledge I have done that throughout the years, especially uh, in Florida where I did my last project. I was doing a book on the migrant workers in Florida in a small town called Immokalee, which is the poorest, one of the poorest towns in the United States. And the, the, it was sponsored by a group of people from Naples, which happens to be one of the wealthiest towns. But Immokalee is misunderstood, and it is, can be very violent, especially at night. So the cops were wonderful. They kept tabs on me, and that night we were cruising and they had a, a, a carnival and this was to celebrate the end of the harvest and this was the picture that I, one of the pictures that I got of showing celebration time uh, and then that would be juxtaposed to the hard work and the lifestyle and the whole thing. It was a wonderful book. Ansel Adams did uh, the, the moon rise over blah blah, everybody knows it. And this is sort of my moonrise uh, photograph because it was handheld and I took it in an instant. I call it pizza by the slice. And I think the, the lighting for, in my point of view is, is, couldn't get better. I was able to document probably the last large group of immigrants that will ever come into the United States and that is the, the the uh, Latin Americans, Mexicans, and, and, and uh, Peruvians, and all, all of these people that, that cross the borders. And I do believe we need rules, and we do need um, a uh, kind of um, uh, organization on how we bring these people in, and we haven't been able to really agree on that as a government. So uh, it, we have to just look at it from a humanitarian viewpoint, at least at this point. And, and I photographed a lot of really lovely young kids who were our candidates for the DREAM Act. And the DREAM Act is a, a bill that has been, they've tried to present uh, to pass in Congress, and that is that if you, if, if your parents came over 
as refugees and they, they cross illegally and they're illegals. And then they have you in the United States. You become a United States citizen. But your parents still are illegals. And uh, if, if your parents are caught and deported, we're, we're, you know, you have nothing. And as an illegal, you can't have a bank account, so you can't put your money in a safe place. You can't have a driver's license. You can't get on an airplane. You are really, really isolated. And the people that work in these fields work extremely hard. It's very, very hard work. So uh, what I was able to do with this, with this book was to show, sort of show that these people are really good people. And they, they came to this country because they wanted the freedom for their family that we all want. Now, my friends in Naples uh, uh, didn't really understand what was going on in Immokalee. They basically didn't care until they came to the show. Uh, they, they really couldn't have cared less. Uh, they, they were happy in their la-la land. And then, of course, they'd come and they'd, they'd see these things. And as a result of the show, several senators uh, and congressmen have their minds have been changed about how we have to operate this and, and make these kids legal. We can't send them back. They, don't, they can't speak Spanish well enough. They don't know how to, they don't know how to maneuver uh, in, in the streets because they never grow, grew up there. So they, they're, they're just going to be killed anyway if they go back. So anyway, we need to get that situation. It's just a humanitarian situation. We need to get that set. And that's what the book Images of Hope talked about. It started out as a six-month project. And three years later, I was going out to Immokalee at three in the morning uh, to photograph them leaving on the buses to go to the places that they had to pick, or I was coming back uh, late at night. Uh, although I spent quite a bit of time in the beginning walking around town without a camera, just talking to people, because I figured that if they knew who I was and they knew why I was there, it would help, and it certainly did. I would pick a family that I thought, where I thought the woman could cook pretty well. And I'd, I'd say, you know, I'd convince her that we have to go to the grocery store and I'll buy all the food and you teach me how to cook, how to cook Mexican food. Here again, we get getting cooking, but, uh, and, and of course we would always, I'd always overbuy. So there was lots of leftovers, but I did that on numerous occasions. In order to, to find another angle in order to 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 get to a human to the part where we, we could actually connect as human beings not as tourists or, or something uh, I would get up early in the morning and because of course I was hungry and because uh, it was my only free time I'd go run down to the to the dim sum or, or the Tibetans call mumus uh, and sit there and these women are Busily making these things for the for the uh, for for the restaurant, and I would join in, and they would help me and correct me on how to my moo moo technique, and and I had a lot of fun with that because they they thought it was really really funny that a foreigner would do this, and I thought it was really great that they'd let me learn. For Chinese moo moos, we would you could add. Uh, sh make shrimp dumplings, or or um, they don't have in the f in the small towns, but in Beijing they do. They you can get crab, and and but uh, we used to make it out of yak meat, which is a, a very good ham kind of hamburger thing, or you can make it out of sheep, not necessarily pigs, but you could, you know. And then you chop that up with cilantro and onions and garlic and. And just, uh, I used mushrooms, but they would use these wood, wood mushrooms, which we often ate because there wasn't any food, but it's that little sort of half round, wiggly little thing. It's very, very good. So now here we go. Dab this just a bit.
You can do vegetarian and then chop that all up and put it in the center and then you make this, just roll this dough of water and hot water and, and flour and roll it out and make a little circle and then put this in the center. And then it's the way you fold it that is the trick. There, there we go. They do fry up very quickly. And then you fry it on one side and then steam it and they're, mm -hmm. they're just yeah, delicious. They're really, really good. Delicious. Mm. Mm. Yummy. Through mm. cooking, through the markets, that's how I would get to the people. And you can always get to a family through the kitchen door. We moved to Saudi Arabia and it was again cooking because next door to us was a team of photographers who were doing underwater research. And in, in Saudi, you, you have these really high, high walls between. So what I would do is I would bake brownies and I'd stick them up over the wall to these bachelors, hoping that they would ask me to go scuba diving with them. And finally they did. And that, when I went underwater, that the moment I sort of fell off that reef uh, and stopped being scared, I thought, I have to photograph this. I just have to photograph this. And so for about a year and a half, the nitrogen never left my body. Morning, noon, and night, we were diving. It was, and then it started. I never, I never did not have a camera on my shoulder or in my hand. I um, uh, always wanted to, to photograph, and so my husband taught me. He gave me a real quick lesson and I had a little Nikon underwater camera. And then the guys I was diving with, they told me, oh, well, in about four months, you'll be able to get something in focus. Well, it didn't happen like that. It was just, it was just some, a gift that I've been given and an eye that I had. And I was off and running with great shots. It's a gift of sensitivity. I, I'm, I'm very, uh, attuned to the people that I photograph. For example, when I'm photographing someone, especially men, men do this, and, and I'm trying to draw, I, I always study about what they've done, and, and so especially famous people, I try to find something that they don't know, that I should know. And, and when I really get to the heart of, of their personality or their soul, they will pull back immediately and that's when I know that I have uh, got that shot. That's really what photography is. It's, it's capturing a moment that will never come back and, and making people understand what that moment is about. Coming up on Talk of the Troll Way, it could be you or someone you know. Talk of the Troll Way is a locally produced TV series highlighting the artistic, entertaining, and interesting people in the Mount Horeb area. Let us know who we haven't met yet. Email talktrollway at gmail.com. Talk of the Trollway is a production of Mount Horeb, Wisconsin's village cable station, Trollway TV. Funding for Talk of the Trollway is provided by Miller & Sons Supermarket. <laughs>